What do animal conservation groups, digital payment systems, and a Ghanaian artist have in common? Well, believe it or not, they all can help to protect the environment. More on that coming up on the show. I am Neota Igwe in Lagos. COVID-19 may be dominating much of our life right now, but we still need to care for the environment. Right, Sandra? That is right, Neota, and a warm welcome from me, Sandra Twinobrio, here in Kampala, Uganda. Statelite data shows that during the lockdown, the air quality has improved in many African cities, but wildlife is still suffering. Animals especially have been the biggest losers in this crisis. Poaching has increased in many of the wildlife reserves. We'll talk about this shortly, and here's a quick look at some of the stories we'll be looking at today. We visit Rwanda, where the government has introduced steps to start phasing out banknotes. We also see how military training grounds can actually promote conservation. And we meet the Ghanaian artist who's using his artworks to call for greater protection of our seas. It is a well-established fact that rhino horn is essentially made up of the same substance as a human fingernail, but it continues to sell for astronomical prices, especially in East Asia, where it is considered to have healing powers. South Africa has nearly 80% of the world's rhinos and has been hit hard by poaching. With only about 20,000 animals left in the wild, the country has now resorted to drastic measures in order to preempt poachers. Packs have started to dehorn all their rhinos. <music> Pilansberg National Park in South Africa. A rhino has been spotted, but sadly, help has come too late. After ripping off its horn, poachers left it as prey for lions. Helicopter pilot Nico Jacobs is out on patrol surveying the area. He is a founding member of the anti-poaching group Rhino 911, an organization that provides emergency helicopter rescue to rhinos injured or orphaned, mostly due to poaching but it also carries out preventive measures. In a last ditch attempt to save them, Rhino 911 has been assigned to help dehorn rhinos in the province. The animals are sedated before the precious horn is sold off. It's a beautiful horn. This is probably about five, six kilograms. And uh, tragic that we need to do this, uh, but unfortunately it's the only option that we have um, to try and do something, you know, try and do trimmings to save these animals' lives. The team needs to work quickly before the rhino wakes up again. Dehorning is a drastic procedure that removes about 90% of the horn. The conservationists tell us that in some areas, even dehorned rhinos are murdered to extract the remaining stumps. Reserves that combine the practice of dehorning with regular food patrol and extensive monitoring could have a chance of saving the large herbivores. It looks brutal, but when carried out by professionals, it is safe and pain-free. Uh, we, we make definitely sure that we don't cut into the growth uh, uh, part of the horn, where there's definitely feeling and where it also wouldn't be good from an infection point of view and regrowth of the horn. Uh, so I think in this case they don't feel, but they're obviously stimulated. There's a lot of vibration going into the body. Uh, this is not a full anesthetic, you know, it's not, a, it's not like being in a theatre. So, the, so they would respond to it, but I don't think it's painful. The process takes about half an hour. The horn is labelled, weighed, photographed, and will later be stored in a secret government vault far away from the park. Improved security measures and interventions such as dehorning have helped South Africa to cut the number of poached animals by half over the past five years. Rhino 911 works closely with the Rhino Orphanage, a non-profit center that cares for orphaned and injured rhino calves. Yolande van der Merve and her colleague are preparing milk for three recent arrivals. They only barely escaped the same fate as their mothers who were butchered for their horns. Yolanda hopes to release the rhinos back into the wild once they have matured. But she is concerned about the rise in poaching as a result of the economic fallout caused by COVID-19. Rhinos are still being killed at a faster pace than they can reproduce. 
Since the COVID-19 has started picking up in South Africa, we've definitely seen an increase in calves arriving. We've had four calves in 53 days. So we definitely think that there is an effect. You know, there's the tourism industries are all closed. It's very quiet out in the reserves. The anti-poaching teams try their best to patrol and, and protect the reserves. But we think that that quiet nature of the reserves definitely has an effect on, on the poaching. Back in Pilansburg, Rhino 911 has spotted two animals on the move. Time to act. Opinions on dehorning are mixed. Some believe it makes male rhinos vulnerable. Others say the horns aren't essential for survival and grow back within about five years. These conservationists see no alternative. Well, we're losing animals at an alarming rate. We're losing 800 rhinos per year in South Africa, and that number is unacceptable. So we need to try and do more. We need to try, you know, and save the species. It's a prehistoric animal, um, and we need to, to save them for generations to come. Okay, we're going to wake up. Most rhinos seem unperturbed when they wake up and simply resume grazing. For three years, Rhino 911 has been working with authorities to dehorn rhinos in public parks and reserves. The precise numbers of those dehorned or murdered are kept secret for their protection. It is sad that such drastic measures are sometimes needed to protect the animals. Now then, it is often said that every little bit helps, and that's certainly the case when it comes to the environment. One young student in Germany has found a way of turning plastic waste into sustainable tiles. And the best thing is, the end product looks just like expensive marble. Take a look at this week's Doing Your Big. These tiles look like marble, but they're actually made of 100% plastic. Anis Akiev creates them from used packaging materials. The designer who's based in Germany first cleans and sorts the waste. Then she heats it in an oven to soften it. The hot plastic releases toxic fumes, so Akiev wears a mask for protection as she kneads and presses the mass simulating what happens in nature. I came up with the idea for the tiles because a lot of plastic waste ends up in the oceans, mostly via rivers in China and Africa. It's broken down into smaller and smaller pieces and ends up on beaches. Through pressure and heat, it becomes part of the stone there. I studied the conditions under which rock is formed, how its structure is created, and then I used a similar process with the plastic waste. The aim is to take waste and turn it into something useful that's also beautiful and durable. A Kiev is now thinking about founding a social enterprise to produce her tiles on a larger scale. If she succeeds, our mountain of plastic waste might get just a little bit smaller. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. They look great indeed. I'm impressed. We are going to stick with the creative theme and protecting the environment, but change continents and come straight back here to Africa. This time to West Africa and specifically the Ghanaian capital, Accra. That's right, Sandra. With their creation, artists can have great influence. They have the power to surprise and fascinate us and also to make us think. Kobina and Yako is a Ghanaian painter whose works draw attention to the destruction of our oceans. Eco Africa paid him a visit to find out more. In his studio, Kwabla Nyaku leaves no doubt about two things he loves deeply, fish and the ocean. His nickname, wait for it, Mr. Fish. Much of his work depicts the sea creatures and their struggle with pollutants dumped into the ocean. Nyaku had no specific theme when he first started painting over 20 years ago, but having grown up in a fishing community, 
his concern for marine life grew with environmental issues becoming more and more pressing. I've been painting from the perspective of the shark's eye and seeing some clean ocean for some years back and now seeing the, seeing the pollution aspect of it, it is going to affect the world and even the kind of fishes we have in the oceans some few years to come if we are not able to do about do anything about getting this waste not ending up in the ocean. The paintings illustrate the beauty of the ocean, contrasting it with the damage done by human activity. While this is a job that Nyako lives off, he hopes it can also serve a greater purpose of helping preserve the ocean for future generations. If we live at this time to see the dinosaurs and all the animals that have died and gone, it is in our power, in our hands, to make sure that the sharks and whales still remain in the ocean. Nyako visits the beach in his community every day, picking up waste washed ashore. He recycles these waste items by using them for his paintings, telling the real stories of how polluted the sea is. But Nyaku has a wish though, to one day live under the sea to observe what goes on there and fight for it to be kept clean. If I have the privilege to live in there, to see the life and how they also live in there, it will be one of the beautiful aspects of, um, of, of my life. The importance of preserving the beauty of the ocean, Nyako's artwork is a constant reminder of that. We head to Senegal now to meet some more individuals dedicated to helping the planet, this time on shore. The NGO Nebede works in the suburbs of the capital Dakar, planting trees wherever they can. These include, first and foremost, Moringa trees, as well as Portia and so-called flamboyant trees. They've involved the residents in the project. That's important because it's only when people realize the benefit of trees that they will protect and take care of them. Planting trees is Nadei Sane's favorite activity. She and a group of volunteers want to make this sandy parking lot on the outskirts of Dakar more hospitable. I'm planting a Samanea Saman. It's a shade tree that can grow up to 20 meters high. A large square full of shady trees. A place to hold celebrations and festivals, somewhere to meet the neighbors. That's the vision. A local NGO has managed to win over the local residents. People need greenery. And as I see it, those who respect the environment respect themselves. So we must do what we can to combat desertification by planting trees all over the city. But it's not enough to just plant trees you need to nurture them as well, day after day. It's imperative to involve the local population. That's what guarantees the survival of the trees. The NGO actually took its name from a tree. Nebede is the word for Moringa in the Wolof language. It's a versatile tree. Its leaves and fruit can be eaten or used for medicinal purposes. Scientists have proven that trees bring rain by contributing to evapotranspiration. They trigger precipitation in the clouds. More trees mean more rain. And the more we cut down, the less rain there is. They say deserts advance, but they don't. It's humans that make it possible. So things must change. We must all plant. Big cities are growing at a breathtaking speed in Senegal. In the past 60 years, the country has lost around half of its forests to urbanization. Tens of thousands of hectares of woodland continue to be destroyed every year. 
There's a lot of pressure on urban centers. The population is rising, there's more construction, and fewer green spaces and trees. We're neglecting nature, and that's why desertification is growing worse in our country. The result, shorter, later, and more irregular wet seasons. In the past, the rain began in June and lasted three months. Now things have changed. Everyone knows the trees are useful, but we don't give ourselves the means to plant them. As a result, with Operation One Million Trees and what we're doing in the neighborhood, we are introducing people to the importance of trees, the importance of greenery. One day, these trees will provide much-needed shade, offering city dwellers respite from the burning sun. Having planted 750,000 trees last year, Nebede is aiming for a million in 2020. Nature is reclaiming some areas in our cities, and it's also making a comeback in another environment where you absolutely wouldn't expect it to, military training grounds. These large secluded areas are used to practice military maneuvers and explode hand grenades. In Germany, for instance, many rare species have found refuge on army training grounds. Birds, wild cards, wolves, all sorts of plants and insects are more or less left to their own devices. In fact, most German military training areas are part of a European network dedicated to preserving biodiversity. Constant tank movements and artillery exercises make nature conservation at this army training ground a complicated affair. Before the ecologists start work, the search party patrols the area to make sure there are no nasty explosive surprises lurking in the grass. They are always accompanied by a munitions expert from the German military. They found a missile. Its location is marked down and later bomb disposal experts will pick it up. You have to search carefully as we use everything from small 20 millimeter ammunition to large ordnance and explosives. Of course, it's much easier to find bombs than to find small munitions. And don't forget, we've been using this troop training area for 80 years, so you find all sorts of stuff here. Those 80 years of army maneuvers have helped create a varied landscape in Baumholder. There are grasslands with wild herbs, as well as woodlands and brush, all ideal for biodiversity. The grasslands are so valuable because they're hard to find anywhere else. There's no arable land, so no pesticides, no nutrients, no fertilizers. This is only for military maneuvers. The army has all the heavy equipment it needs to preserve the natural environment. This armored vehicle is used to take care of open spaces to make sure they don't get overgrown. It tears up shrubs and it flattens small trees. Germany has 1,400 square kilometers of land for military drills. The environmental group NABU commissioned a study and found something astonishing. Although there are pollutants like heavy metals and kerosene residue, the sites are ecologically important. The situation in these areas is unique. The exercises create a patchwork environment. There are temporary changes, what we ecologists call disturbances. In areas where soil is removed, there are pioneer sites where rare plants can grow, as well as animal species you can't find in the regular landscape. Destruction by tanks and artillery creates new ecological niches, says army ecologist Wilfried Groten. Ponds form in tank trails and bomb craters, where frogs and newts can spawn. This is not static environmental protection. Habitats are constantly changing. There are also valuable areas not in regular use by the military where nature can evolve organically. In the areas used less often, they deploy sheep. Several thousand sheep graze all summer long on the military training ground. What makes sheep really useful is that they get into all the corners, under the bushes, into parts of the woods we can't reach. A machine can't do that. The sheep's footprints, grazing and droppings get the turf into the state that nature needs. These sheep have spent numerous summers in the military zone and are well used to it, says shepherd Karl-Heinz Kinkel. Generally, whenever they're shooting, even heavy fire, you'd be amazed how fast they adapt. If they do get frightened, they huddle together. 
In Germany, large swathes of the natural environment have been wiped out, chiefly through intensive farming. The untamed land in army training areas is highly valuable in ecological terms. In Baumholder, despite the bombs and grenades, this unique environment gets special protection. The power of nature is amazing, but we shouldn't rely too much on nature's ability to heal itself. We humans are responsible for the environmental destruction and deforestation that are happening to drive climate change. And here in Africa, we're especially hard hit by the consequences. That is right in Niota. Let us look at Rwanda. This small Central African country has lost nearly 20% of its forest cover in just the last 10 years. But the country is working hard to clean up its act with recycling initiatives and a ban on plastics. Now, digital payment systems could provide another helping heart. If you want to take a motorbike taxi in Rwanda's capital Kigali, for example, you can't pay with banknotes anymore. And that's just the start. Rwanda hopes increasingly to phase out paper money. Back on the road. After two months of coronavirus-induced absence, motorcycle taxi drivers in the Rwandan capital Kigali are back to work. But one thing is not as it used to be. Mobile payments are now mandatory. Cash is a thing of the past. As well as that being more hygienic, drivers are experiencing other benefits too. The device means I no longer have to bargain with the client about the cost of the trip. Now, it's the meter that determines the fare. It's also eliminated cash transactions. Whenever I transport a passenger, they pay electronically. The system has been in place since May. 28,000 motorcycle taxi drivers have signed up. The technology behind it was developed by a Rwandan company. They are registering their names on our platform and also they are opening a bank account. We're working with the uh, local bank so that they can be uh, open a bank account at the same time and registering um, their name on our platform. After signing up, the drivers get a smartphone, which they pay off at a later date. The devices are for processing payments and for personal use. Cashless payments are already in use on buses in Rwanda. Passengers use so-called smart cards, but not everyone likes them. I don't trust electronic transactions. When I go to the bank, I withdraw paper money, and there is a record of that on paper. But this new system is not entirely safe. It was better before. Other skeptics include market vendors who continue to work with cash. But they might be fighting a losing battle because the government is aiming to reduce the use of paper in general, and that includes banknotes. The composition of our waste, uh, 6 to 8 percent, is made of paper waste. So one of the benefits will be uh, cutting uh, the waste, and cutting the waste also, it's, it has uh, uh, an impact on sanitation. Uh, second is uh, going greener through reducing wood harvest. Since the pandemic, newspapers have been pushed to go digital only. At first, publisher Jeanette Umum Arashavu saw a decline in sales, but now she sees the impact of going digital. You no longer see those paper bags in Kigali or somewhere in Rwanda. So I think that is, that is our fall down. After COVID-19, say goodbye to the print media, to papers, other things like cash. So we need to opt to the digitalization system. These days, traditional paper newspapers have been relegated to libraries. Readers now need to go online. The coming months will show just how much of a difference the going paper-free measures are making in Rwanda.
mobile money is nothing new to Africa. Let us see how fast the idea catches on. And of course, we'll keep our eyes open and let you know how it goes. But now we've come to the end of our show for today. And I'm excited that you could join us. Thank you all for watching. I am Sandra Trinovio here in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. Thank you, Sandra. It's bye for me too in Lagos, Nigeria. We will be back next week with more inspiring stories on how we can make our planet a better place to live in despite the pandemic. See you next time and do stay healthy.